Uh, in Studio B, Jerem Jordan alongside Jason Shepard. You heard our answers on the GOAT in BYU football. Let's get the answer of Riley Nelson, BYU radio analyst, former BYU quarterback himself. Riley, I wish the answer was you. Sadly, it is not. But who is your GOAT in BYU football history? Yeah, here's how I absolve myself from that uh, from that conversation is, <laughs> no. Hey, I, I, disclaimer, I do not believe in an all-time because I believe that sports evolve so much over that it has to be the greatest of an era. Now, that said, I will, you know, play into your guys' little exercise. <laughs> um, What's little about it? Why are you minimizing our show, Riley? It's got to be it's got to be Ty Detmer for me, uh, you know, multiple consensus All-American retired with not just BYU records, but national records that still stand some of which still stand to this day. Of course, the pinnacle individual achievement um, in the Heisman Trophy. And even though he wasn't able to, you know, capture national championship, the you know, you look at best wins that Miami win. And, and of course, BYU was was uber successful. My. My second would be Jim McMahon. And keep in mind, my criteria is what was done at BYU. Whatever happens beyond, to me, is uh, some people, and and that's fine. They can take that as part of their evaluation criteria, um, but it doesn't for me. If we want to have a different discussion of who's the greatest pro to come out of BYU, then the list mixes up a little bit. But for me, it's Ty Detmer 1, Jim McMahon 2. You're a very smart man, Riley. I'm just uh, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so let's go then the, the greatest non-QB GOAT. So if we're taking the QBs out of it and we're opening it up wide open to everybody that's come through, who do you think is the GOAT for BYU football? So for me, um, well, here, two big uh, evaluation criteria for me are consensus All-American and then an individual award, uh, you know, winning that. So, like, Jason Buck comes to mind. Um, of course, he was a multi-all-conference uh, player and then the Outland Trophy winner and a consensus All-American. Gordon Hudson was a two-time consensus All-American. Um, I, I started thinking about running backs, and that, that really, the, what about the 2000s from running backs to go from Luke Steady, then Curtis Brown became the all-time leading rusher, then Harvey Unger right after him, and then Jamal right after him, and then we just got done with Tyler Algiers. I mean, all that in succession. So those guys kind of almost because of the greatness as a whole, they almost kind of like battle each other down uh, like, you know, um, two candidates in a political race that are stealing votes from each other. But uh, non, and then you look at wide receivers, of course, you got to throw Austin Holly in there and Colley in there. The guy who I played with Cody Hoffman, still atop the all time leader uh, board in, in ca those categories and all those things. If you had to, and then uh, going back to the defensive side of the ball, even though there wasn't consensus all American or outland trophy, I, it's hard to argue against not only the numbers and production that Kyle Van Vanoy produced, but the sheer level of excitement that he brought to the game. Like people would tune, it's rare that you tune in to watch a defensive player, but when Kyle Vanoy was here at BYU, that was most definitely the case. So um, on that one, maybe giving a little bit more deference to history and that, and that consensus all American uh, offensively uh, Gordon Hudson defensively, probably Jason Buck. And those are great picks. I think if the Mackey Award exists when Gordon Hudson plays, he wins it. He might have won it twice. <laughs> like, we've talked about that 83 team on the show. Like, he doesn't even play the whole season, and he's still a consensus All-American. Like, the respect that Gordon Hudson garnered was incredible. So, okay, let's talk about the current BYU team now. Jaron Hall had a tremendous 2021 season. Cam Miller's coming out and saying, hey, he thinks he's first-round potential. We've talked with you on the show about that. So if that were to actually happen, what would have to happen this season for Jaron to merit such uh, a claim for a potential first round pick in the future? He has to have two or three games where they almost win. They win because of him or like, let's say the defense just is a sieve, right? Let's say that he's getting pressured all over the place, but like you, but somehow BYU still pulls it out and it's because Basically, he put the team on his back. To me, that's what I want to see from Jaron Hall to to really truly validate him as as uh, great because he's he's got great numbers. Uh, he's an incredibly good leader and decision maker and all those things. But yet, what I'm yet to see from him 
is put the team on his back and deliver a win. I think there's been instances in, in losses where he's put, like, you look at his numbers in the Baylor game, it was great, but you need numbers and you need the end result and the most important stat, which is getting the win. So for me, and, and I'm not an NFL scout, I'm not an NFL evaluator, uh, but for me, uh, as far as other guys watching college football and being a fan of college football for the last 20 years, uh, Andrew Luck put guys on his back. Russell Wilson put guys on his back, you know, or, or put his team on his back. Even more recently, Trevor Lawrence, you know, put Clemson on his back at times. And and that's what I we've seen flashes of, but I haven't seen that like signature game, that signature win, signature put the team on his back from Jaron Hall. You know, Riley, there are so many factors that go into how somebody is viewed. And, you know, for, for one of them, it, it could be who you follow. And Jaron Hall is following Zach Wilson, who had an unbelievable final year in Provo and is the number two pick overall. Um, I thought Jaron was amazing last year. Do you think Jaron Hall is underappreciated? That's a good question. Um... No, I don't think so, because I've seen a ton of appreciation for him. I don't think he has a lot of detractors. I think you might be answering this. I mean, I don't I don't want to um, guess at the motives of your question, but I know that this was out there a little bit in some fan blog. The fact that BYU was actively going after Jackson Dart, uh, the former USC QB who entered the transfer portal, ended up committing to Ole Miss. I think people saw that as a slight to... Uh, as a slight to Jaron, it's not. You got to understand that these coaches have their livelihoods on the line. And rule number one of success, like look at college football. Why is it Alabama? Why is it always Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson? Why is it all these same teams? Because in to a large degree, they have a monopoly on talent. And so the bottom line is talent wins. As much as you know, there you like scheme and you like coaches and their ability to create culture and motivate. The reality is if you've got players and if you've got a lot of them, you're going to increase your likelihood for success as a team. So it, it is incumbent upon every coach, the, both the head coach, coordinators and, and position coaches at BYU, whenever they have a shot and going out and getting talent, even if talent already exists within the program, they have to do it. So anybody who took BYU's recruitment of Jackson Dart or any other, you know, quarterback, um, as a slide against Jaron Hall, I, l let me, that is not the case. And then I would say generally he, he is appreciated. Here's another couple things that may add to that perception. Aaron Roderick provides a very quarterback friendly system. He's a lot like Kyle Shanahan or, you know, the LaFleurs or McVay to where their system is almost such that it's, it's plug and play. But that said, Jaron's still got to be the one pulling the triggers, making the decisions. He, he's done an absolutely uh, great job at that. And then the second thing is when you're handing the ball off to Tyler Algier and you got guys like Puka Nakua, Gunnar Romney, Neil Powell on the outside, it feels like, you know, a lot of the pressure is taken off you. But again, going back, he's still got to make the right run checks to have Tyler be successful. He's still got to, you know, give those guys a chance to make plays. And he's still got to, you know, put them, put the offense as a whole as a position win, all of which he has done. So um, uh, I would... I don't get the sense that he's grossly underappreciated. He might be by some individuals, but I'd say on the whole, he's he's well-liked and well-appreciated, and that's well-deserved. And it feels like he'll have more on his plate next year with no Tyler LG or Christopher Brooks. We hope was certainly a thousand-yard guy and really good, but what we saw from Tyler Algier was, uh, was unique, was special. It had never been done in BYU history. Now we look to the backup. If uh, Baylor Romney is indeed not going to return at BYU, that is a possibility apparently, but it sounds like and looks like he's going to move on. How do you feel about Jacob Conover as the backup, given the little that we've seen him play against Utah State? Yeah, such a small sample size and, you know, getting your first snaps on the road in a hostile environment and, and really not with, with going in with a lead like that in the second half, not being asked to do much. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard psyche. It was a great experience in my opinion for Jacob to, to get those first uh, snaps because he's going to be able to look on that experience and realize, you know what, like don't play to, because where you're in a position to, to not lose, as opposed to go out and make a win. I'll, I'll use myself as an example, right? That Utah state game, my junior year being thrown in, it was like, we had nothing to lose. So I could go out and play free and make, because we were already down, you know, 11 points or whatever it was late in the third quarter. So I could go out and play free wheeling. It would have been a different story when you're putting the game, say, you know, down 11 um, or up 11 and the other team has momentum and you got to hold on. So he'll learn a lot from that, but he's a, he's a guy uh, by all accounts, 
um, that I hear from other guys within the program. And then also knowing Jake a little bit myself, uh, he, he, as the kids say, he wants that smoke. He, he's waiting anxiously for his opportunity. Um, and he's, he's a tireless worker. His teammates, you know, think highly of him. They respect him as, as a leader and, and um, he's waiting for his opportunity. I, I personally feel good. Uh, or Well, I guess I should say this. I feel as good as you can for a guy that has, what, maybe eight or nine uh, pass attempts in his career. Let's stay with the offense. And I'm curious your take on expectations for this offense next year. Because obviously, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, you don't have Tyler Algier. You know, you have a couple of receivers that, uh, that have, they're moving on. But there's still a lot of talent here. You still have Jaron Hall. To your point that you mentioned, you know, Aaron Rodgers now been uh, here at BYU for several seasons. And things have been implemented that guys should be able to hit the ground running or passing, depending on what they decide to do. Uh, what are your realistic expectations for this offense next year? For me, it all starts with the offensive line. Obviously, getting the five-star transfer into the program uh, helps build up your depth there. And how many injuries that unit, that position group, experienced over the course of last, last season and yet held up, right? They, they passed the test of depth. And so you get all those guys back. Of course, you know, you've got MP who was kind of at both being the senior, the center and the senior statesman uh, of that position group in that offensive line. You can't understate uh, the, the task that will be the person that steps into that center position, but you feel like you've got, you know, those eight or nine bodies with enough talent to be successful. Uh, replacing Tyler Algier will be the biggest one. Obviously, you know, hopefully Brooks can turn out to be a Tyson Williams. Uh, there was a lot of great success. Obviously, we all know the unfortunate season-ending injury that he had, but he's gone on to prove that he was an NFL caliber talent, and hopefully Brooks is the same as well as the other guys that that remain, right? Katoa's coming back again, and you, you've got McChesney there, and there was excitement coming out of fall camp and a guy like Hinkley Rapati and some other guys um, that are chomping at the bit to to prove their worth. So, and then I, I think tight ends and uh, obviously Isaac Rex uh, wish him the best coming back from what seemed to be a really uh, complicated and gruesome injury. But there's other tight ends that made plays over the course of the season. So the biggest question for me starts with the, the dudes up front, and then whoever's toting the rock in the backfield. And if those guys can, I mentioned Roderick and kind of having a Shanahan esque. Uh, offensive line. Well, we all know that that starts with establishing the run. Then you get play action, play action shots, and and your drop back. Everything is a is a byproduct of your ability to be successful in establishing the run. So if if those guys come back, if that if, if the five up front can uh, you know hit the ground running, and then that back can do work behind them. Obviously, we know what Jaron and a lot of the guys on the outside can do. So I wouldn't expect much of a drop off going from last year to this. Can't wait for it. Cannot wait for that O-line to be pancaking fools coming up in September. It's going to be awesome. Riley, we appreciate the time, man. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, Riley. Riley. Riley Nelson, radio analyst for BYU Radio, dropping some knowledge here.